Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for best practices for UEFI Secure Boot Guidelines. We'll get started in just a few moments. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for best practices for UEFI Secure Boot Guidelines as part of the UEFI 2021 Virtual Plug Fest. We did want to take a moment here to introduce you to the presenters. So we have Tim Lewis, who's the CTO at Inside Software, and then we have Manoj uh, Kandewal, who is a software engineer at HPE. And I'll go ahead and pass it off to the presenters now. Thank you, Megan. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tim Lewis. Today, we want to talk a little bit about uh, a white paper that was produced by the National Security Agency, the NSA of the United States, titled uh, UEFI Secure Boot Customization. This was released back in September of 2020, and the link to this paper can be found in the uh, resources slide at the end of this presentation. But the idea of this, present this paper from the NSA was to give guidelines for configuring platform firmware to take advantage of the security promise provided by Secure Boot. Firmware has increasingly become the target of malware because of its unique role in setting up and maintaining the platform's hardware security capabilities. Also, mal malware manages to avoid antivirus solutions uh, today, which are limited in their ability to detect and remove the malware. UEFI's Secure Boot prevents malware that targets platform firmware from getting started by verifying that each component is trusted before using it. That is, you maintain a chain of trust from the point of reset up until the time that the firmware hands off control to the OS. The NSA's six guidelines help IT administrators and end users correctly configure UEFI's Secure Boot and the related settings in their BIOS. UEFI and the related specifications enable these capabilities. They provide a sort of toolbox that you can use to, to create a secure system in the firmware, but you have to use your toolbox so, and you have to use it correctly. So we're talking about how you configure based on the actual use case of your platform. So these are the uh, overview of the six guidelines that we're going to talk about today. Uh, turning some obvious ones, but turning on UEFI boot, turn on UEFI secure boot, customize UEFI secure boot, set strong administrator passwords, update bias regularly, and verify bias integrity with a TPM. So let's take a look at the first one. You know, it, it does seem sort of obvious we are on a UEFI uh, webinar. Um, we are talking about UEFI Secure Boot, but the first rec guideline from the NSA's paper is that you need to turn on UEFI Boot. This is a quote actually from their white paper. Machines running legacy or compatibility support module, CSM, should be migrated to UEFI native mode. Current platforms that are shipping mostly support UEFI Boot but the security advantages of UEFI are negated if you don't turn on UEFI. The previous legacy boot standard is inherently insecure. 
leaving opportunities for malware to insert itself into the boot process and many other and many other flaws. Now, so you can turn it off, but many of bias vendors also allow a dual mode or a combo mode that tries to intelligently switch between legacy and UEFI based on whether you have legacy option ROMs or legacy you're trying to boot a legacy OS. While this mode is convenient, this mode is not secure because it's easy to divert the boot, boot path into a mode which actually launches uh, legacy code. So why do companies turn off UEFI boot? If it's such a great thing, it's been around since 2005 uh, for the UEFI and EFI even longer, why do you turn it off? Uh, well, there's lots of reasons that are given. It's working today, why change it? This is the, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, my OS or application only works in legacy mode. The next one's a little bit in, more interesting. My plug-in video card doesn't work or your network card or your RAID card doesn't work. This is because the while the device might be a PCI device, the option ROM that's on it uh, may contain a legacy formatted uh, option ROM code rather than an EFI formatted one. And they don't want to lose that card. Maybe there's not an update available that's UEFI compatible. So you want to support your plugin cards. Um, or maybe internal processes tied to an OS or an application are only available in legacy mode. Maybe the person who wrote it isn't even with the company anymore, and you're not quite sure how that script or how that application really works. So there's definitely some work sometimes to transition uh, to turn off UEFI boot. There's a money or resource consideration that needs to be brought into the equation. But the truth is, no matter what the excuse that's used for uh, keeping legacy on, NSA's guidelines state clearly, leveraging legacy mode or CSM reintroduces security access control and memory vulnerabilities addressed by the UEFI standard and prohibits the use of UEFI secure boot. So after we've turned on UEFI boot, the next recommendation from the NSA is to turn on UEFI secure boot. Secure boot should be enabled on all endpoints and configured to audit firmware modules, expansion devices, and bootable images. This really establishes a chain of trust going from the point that the CPU gains control and reset all the way up until the time that you hand off the OS, whether it's the, the firmware modules that are built into the flash, uh, firmware that's built onto expansion plugin devices, or the OS images which the firmware is going to launch. You want to make sure that each of them has been checked by the BIOS before it's launched. Now, some systems have tried to meet their boot speed requirements by allowing sort of a fast boot option in setup uh, to that uh, try to go faster and faster. And they do this by skipping the measuring or verifying certain parts of the firmware. And this defeats the chain of trust because you can't really ver you're not really checking to see if the firmware is trusted. And this fact has been exploited by several malware, most recently Trick Boot, and before that the Lojack, um, the Lojack malware that try that actually low puts itself into the unused space of a BIOS and then gets launched. So you need to do the entire uh, chain of trust all the way from reset till you hand off. To the operating system. Now, once you have UEFI boot turned on and you have UEFI secure boot turned on, then you might want to customize UEFI secure boot. The NSA guidelines say secure boot should be customized if necessary to meet the needs of organizations and their supporting hardware and software. Now, UEFI secure boot by itself is uh, offers a level of security, but it's possible even to increase that level of security even further by customizing it. Uh, most BIOS setup utilities and many BMC management interfaces allow the secure boot keys and certificates to be replaced. That is, if you know exactly the operating system that you're going to use on your platform, and if you know exactly which device that's going to be, then you can make some adjustments uh, to UEFI Secure Boot that's offered that are offered by many implementations, including insides, uh, to 
custom, customize it and make it more secure. So let's look at some of these things. Why would I customize UEFI Secure Boot? Well, when you customize UEFI Secure Boot, it allows administrators of the platform to respond to certain vulnerabilities without waiting for a BIOS update. That is, a BIOS update may come out, there may be even a fix available, and some of these may be something you can implement on your platform just by using the BIOS setup menu on your platform. For example, recently there was a series of vulnerabilities disclosed uh, in Grub and Shim, uh, like Boothole and the eight additional CVEs that were disclosed. And you could fix them. Uh, you, that is, you could prevent those versions of Grub and Shim from being loaded by updating the UEFI security revocation list from setup in most BIOS implementations. Of course, you have to do this with care. Anytime you're talking about playing with the secure boot configuration, including the revocation list, you run the risk of not being able to boot the operating system that's actually installed on your platform. That is, you wanna make sure you've updated your OS version to the version that has this fix uh, installed with guidance from your OS provider before you do it, because you don't want that, oops, I accidentally stopped my platform being, from being able to boot. Another uh, reason you might want to customize your UEFI Secure Boot is to further reduce the attack vectors by preventing any other OS from booting at all. That is, right, the, the standard UEFI Certificate Authority certificate that Microsoft uh, provides and, and, and administers uh, and is in most BIOS uh, Secure Boot databases when they ship allows any, sign, any operating system that has been signed by by this certificate authority to boot normally and that may, that's great because that allows off-the-shelf operating systems to be booted by off-the-shelf platforms but if you know exactly which os boot lo loader you're going to use on your platform or you know exactly which plug-in option uh plug-in pcie devices you're going to plug in and their option roms you can instead install the signatures or hashes of that bootloader or option uh, directly into the secure boot database and remove, remove the default certificate entirely. This means that you have removed the um, certain types of attacks by reducing the attack surface. So you can reduce that. Another thing you can do as an administrator of a platform to customize UEFI secure boot is to disable booting to OS environments which might give the users enhanced access. That is, you've all been with, you've all gone into uh, Costco, you've all gone into Best Buy, and you've seen the system which has been hijacked by some enterprising person who's walked in with their USB key and booted up onto their own application and perhaps is playing Pac-Man instead of running the nice demo that was prepared by the platform vendor. In the same way, you don't necessarily want people to be able to walk up to your platforms and change the operating system that's being booted to because they might do something that you don't that is outside of your control not one that your organization recommends so you want to be able to boot from reset up into the hard drive that, that's internal to the device not something that someone walks up and plugs in you can also do this by preventing the changing of the boot order these are options that are uh, available on many implementations of uh, uefi and if you have them, you can use them to customize and secure your platform further. Now at this time, we're gonna look at a, a platform from Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and Manoj is gonna talk, talk us through it, of a platform that took this even one step further to make sure that their platform was secure. Manoj? Uh, good morning, good evening to all. Uh, thank you, Tim. So for HP controller product, actually, I did some UFI secure boot customization, and I will talk about these only in today's webinar. Okay, so basically why I had to customize, uh, there were some reason, actually, a few reasons. So we can see these reasons one by one. Actually, we don't have bias setup access in our controller product. So in this case, we need to have secure boot enabled by default and it cannot be disabled at all, right? So with this, uh, actually we are integrating multiple HP keys within our BIOS and mesh. And these keys are used for various purposes like BIOS integrity checks, secure capsule update, or next stage loader authentication. As we don't have any BIOS user interface or OS bash shell access, how we will update these keys in the field 
in case we need to update these, right? So basically we use secure capsule method for updating these keys using BIOS update. Another point is, for example, if you're using Intel Denoton SOC, just an example, right, in your product, you will find that this actually doesn't have any hardware root of trust. Uh, that other code name is Intel Boot Guard, which is normally available in higher end Intel chipset like Cascade Lake, right? So in absence of this Intel Boot Guard, how you will make your system secure from root itself? So these are the all reasons. And how I address these, uh, we'll talk in next few slides. Okay, uh, so before I talk about secure capsule generation and uh, how actually we update it, uh, one assumption is there in our product, OS and application actually not having any writing permission for BIOS flash. So only running BIOS can update the BIOS image using secure capsule method. Also BIOS, uh, before uh, it transfer the control to the OS loader, our SPA flash is locked, okay? So now let's talk about how we create secure capsule for BIOS upgrade. To create a secure capsule, uh, basically we need two files. Uh, one is our BIOS image we want to program and another one is SPA flashing utility, utility which basically perform the actual SPA writing. So we can include third file also as a configuration file for this flashing utility so that at runtime we can, we can control its behavior. Now we combine these three files into a single package, okay? And then we perform the signing to create a secure capsule. But if you observe this flashing utility within this package is also external to the system. So this also need to be signed before we create a final combined package, right? So basically two signing is applied, uh, one for flash utility uh, within the package and other for the whole package. Okay, uh, now let's talk about how we trigger the BIOS upgrade in our product. So what we does after creating the capsule, actually we, we, we bundle this capsule within our OS actually, OS rootfs basically you can say. Then from the OS, we copy the capsule file to some designated location EFI partition. This EFI partition is visible or accessible in BIOS 2. Uh, this capsule file location is hard coded in BIOS. Then we set OS indication U5 variable. If you're aware like uh, with this OS indication set, uh, like BIOS can identify whether BIOS upgrade need to happen or not. So after triggering the reboot, once BIOS start, first check this UFI variable is set and that capsule image is available at the designated location. If yes, then we verify the whole capsule, then we verify the flash utility now that is available within capsule. Uh, and this verification is done using our HP integrated keys, which is available within our firmware image, uh, like within BIOS image. Once verification is passed, then BIOS upgrade happen. And then we clear the OS indication variable and delete the capsule file. So this is all about secure capsule part. Okay, uh, so now come to the bias integrity check part. So uh, there were actually some challenges I face to make this bias integrity check working. So let's first talk about these challenges and then how I addresses them and we will talk there. First challenge was uh, we can't consider whole bias flash for integrity check because few reasons contend in this bias uh, in this SPA bias flash right change across reboot. Okay, again, let's take example in this Intel Denoton case, this e NIC EEPROM is emulated within SPA flash. Uh, there is a GB reason. So basically this NIC, entire NIC EEPROM is emulated within that GB reason. So let's say if someone boot to the OS and if let's say user want to change the MAC address of any NIC interface, right? Then SPA content will also be changed, right? So you can't consider whole SPA flash for integrity checking. Another example is non-volatile U5 variable, what we have seen OS indication in previous slide, right? So these variables is also part of your SPA flash only, and these variables values change across reboot. So these are the reason, uh, basically you can't consider whole flash for integrity check. So what you have to do, you have to do identify which reason within bias flash are constant, first thing, and second is which are important basically. So the, the contents are constant and, and are important, then only uh, for those reasons only we can apply the integrity check. Uh, one, one example, such important reason uh, could be a microcode reason, right? Where most of the vulnerabilities fixes from Intel goes. So we can consider uh, this reason as a integrity check. Other challenge was, as I explained in previous slide of secure capsule, uh, like keeps capsule having an HP header. When we sign the capsule image, right? then this capsule having HP header signature and certificate as a trailer. 
but once capsule is verified these header signature or certificate are stripped off before writing biosimilars to the spi flash so the image in spi flash doesn't contain any hp header or trailer for verification so without this how we will verify the bias integrity right so in next slide i will explain how we address the challenges okay so okay so let's first talk about bias integrity check by bias uh, actually here running bias actually doing the integrity check of itself so this solution we can call as a software root of trust basically not the hardware root of trust but software root of trust and how we achieve this so basically we introduce a new reason uh, within bias image we call as a signature reason that signature reason is big enough to hold a hp signature header and certificate post bias build uh, we calculate hash of important reason we identify like micro code reason or hct code reason or bias version uh, this bvd table right bias version date table basically once combined hash is calculated we store it in a file and then uh, we send it to our uh, hp signing server we get the sign hash uh, hash file which contains signature public key and certificate all these we copy it into signature signature reason once like we flash this one and uh, let's say system reboot so during boot actually by a early phase calculate combined hash from all valid reason in spi flash then it check if signature reason is valid or not by doing all the checks for example like certificates are valid or not their signature is valid or not and if everything is right then finally it compare computed hash right whatever we computed uh, bias actually computed the hash in the page with the stored hash in the signature reason if both hashes are same then actually it's allowed to boot further else make system in halt state okay now bias integrity check by external chip this solution you can call hardware root of trust real hardware root of trust right so you can see the block diagram this block diagram shows the overall scheme the implementation has a cryptographic microcontroller uh, similar to tpm which does the authentication of bias stored in the spi flash this crypto chip having otp provision also uh, where we can fuse our public key hash the key which is used to check the bias integrity so this overall flow is same what we discussed in uh, previous on software root of trust right except that here crypto chip doing the integrity check rather than bias as you can see there are two spi master in block diagram right so uh, like one master is crypto chip other one is x86 cpu post power on crypto chip act as a default spi master and perform the bias integrity check once authentication done it make x86 cpu out of reset by applying plt reset and power boot signal if authentication fail then it keep x86 cpu in the reset so with this scheme uh, you having many advantages uh, for example highly secured bias protection and cannot be even hacked by replacing the bias flash physically so let's say if even someone remove the bias flash right and bound its own version of bias system won't boot another advantage actually it reduce heavy duty fpg type of bias protection implementation right which is found in other uh, products so at least it's a cost saving solution yeah so this is all from my side uh, now tim will take the control back and talk about some password related stuff tim please all right thanks manoj so you can see that you can take all sorts of solutions for customizing uefi secure boot in order to achieve the nsa guidelines uh, including systems that don't have setup and systems that want to increase using a crypt, uh, external crypto chip but if you do have a setup utility then you want to make sure that according to the NSA, you set strong administrator passwords. Firmware should be secured using a set of administrator passwords appropriate for a device's capabilities and use case. The UEFI specification does provide password support. Most implementations of UEFI have uh, uh, passwords of various types, user passwords, administrator passwords, hard drive passwords. But the one we want to focus on here is the administrator password. Administrator uh, passwords in most platforms restrict access to the bias configuration options that control UEFI Secure Boot and other platform security features. You don't want just anyone being able to, who has physical access to your machine to be able to change the Secure Boot configuration, uh, change which operating systems can boot, change whether you're enforcing secure UEFI Secure Boot, stuff like that. So you want to have strong administrator passwords because if the password is not secure, the bias is not secure. 
And if the bias is not secure, the platform is not secure. Now, some guidance on administrator passwords is that firmware passwords should meet the same industry-wide requirements as OS passwords in terms of complexity, length, reuse, etc. Possibly even adding, if supported, a second factor authentication, such as a dongle or a smart card. The UEFI spec does talk about smart cards as well. Uh, weak or reused passwords are still a problem that require each organization to establish a policy for creating and tracking passwords. And this gets more and more important the larger of number of platforms your organization needs to track. If you track passwords for, for the OS to allow access to the OS root, you want to track passwords that allow access to the UEFI secure boot. Now, a lot of platforms, as they ship out of the factory, have no password at all. Or if they do have a password, it's the default password. You all know what I'm talking about. You all have a router that came with a username admin, password admin. Those default passwords are dangerous passwords because they give you a false sense of security. But effectively, from a security standpoint, they are the same as no password. A hacker can lock you out of your own system or introduce unnoticed changes to security. This uh, issue has become so serious that governments are in fact addressing this through regulation. In California, where I live, S uh, the law SB 327 requires a unique default password for each device or forcing a user to set their own password the first time they connect. So not only do you need to have passwords, you need to have, make sure that you're not just using a default password. Now, we've all talked about enabling secure boot, enabling UEFI boot, having your administrator password set up correctly, customizing UEFI secure boot. But even with all of those things, firmware vulnerabilities will st still arise. There will still be something that happens. Uh, inside in the month of uh, uh, March, in tracking security incidents related to firmware, tracked 38 different firmware inc security incidents across all of the firmware uh, spectrum that we track. So the NSA recommends that firmware should be updated regularly, as regularly and treated as importantly as operating system and application updates. Now that's easy to say, but actually firmware often gets forgotten and left behind. Fortunately, UEFI does provide a standard mechanism for passing firmware updates called capsules to the BIOS. They can, similar to what Manoj was describing for the HPE platform. Like other software in the system, firmware may need regular updates as security issues are discovered and security fixes released. Security issues will be discovered, security fixes will be released, and often long after the platform has shipped. So, for, so how does this work in terms of a computer user uh, who's bias update guidance, especially in the IT department? First of all, are you notified when a firmware security update is available? Did you even know that one has been for your platform? Are, or are you required to go to the website of your computer manufacturer and poll that website periodically to see if a new update has happened? Are these updates reliably distributed and applied within your company, especially those systems which um, may not be on the open internet, but may be available on the in the intranet of your company? or maybe in a lab somewhere where physical access could be used to, to uh, tamper with the bias. Do your bias settings allow these firmware updates to be applied without human error, without human intervention? NSA guidelines point out that hard disk passwords or user passwords that halt the firmware update reboot cycle are not recommended because they prevent the automatic, simple and seamless application of firmware. For a computer manufacturer, are the updates published in such a way that they will be detected and applied by the computer, the computers that, for the computers that you manufacture? Is there some way other than someone polling your website to find out if the updates are available? Do you provide them using LVFS on the, for the Linux side or Windows Update for the Windows side, or even through a proprietary utility that pulls and notifies the user? Is there a way that they know and they automatically get applied? The sixth guideline from the uh, NSA 
is to verify and bias integrity with a TPM. A trusted platform module should be leveraged to check the integrity of firmware and the secure boot configuration. The Trusted Computing Group provides specifications that layer additional security capabilities on top of UEFI Secure Boot. These capabilities are complementary to the ones that are available in UEFI. The BIOS uses the TPM to measure the firmware and the Secure Boot configuration and passes this measurements, these measurements to the operating system. This way, the operating system can actually audit what the firmware has done to make sure how it calculated these hashes and can see whether the, any of these measurements has changed boot to boot. This allows TPM aware OS bootloaders to check that measurements at boot match recorded golden measurements. Examples of this include Microsoft's bootloaders, the trusted shim, trusted grub, tboot, TPM RE find. All of these uh, are examples of TPM aware OS bootloaders. That, that look backwards in time to see that uh, nothing has changed, whereas uh, UEFI Secure Boot looks forward in time. So that leads to some call to action. First of all, I would recommend highly to go and read the NSA uh, white paper, which is listed in the uh, which is listed in the resources at the end here. Um, when you're going to deliver or you're going to buy platforms that you want them to be con configurable more securely based on the NSA guidelines. Can your platform uh, meet the NSA guidelines and allow you to customize it for your environment and use cases? The second thing is, hey, enable UEFI Secure Boot. You can consider customization for more control, but UEFI Secure Boot already offers a tremendous level of security advantages. UEFI has great security features if you use them. Third, write down a specific UEFI configuration for each make and model of device. Write them down. The sharpest, the, the dullest pencil is better than the sharpest mind. Write them down. That way they can be passed on. That way you can use them the next time when you have the same model come in, you can look back. Finally, enable and activate the trusted platform module on your, on your platform. Um, Inside does have a white paper, which is also in the resources, which talks about how to do all of these things for Inside's bias. I uh, advise that you take a look. And if you just want a quick reference, the NSA's UEFI Lockdown Quick Guidance is a really good, like, short reference, checkbox list sort of thing to make sure you've done all of these things. At this time, I just want to say thank you for coming to this webinar, and we're going to go on to questions. Thank you. The first question here is, are there systems out there that implement all of the NSA guidelines? Are they common? There are systems out there that do implement all of these things. Um, and they are relatively common, at least for, for it, in the customization area, you often have a little bit of variation here, but in general, most UEFI platforms implement all of these features. Next question here on systems without BIOS password configured or default password, does NOS management software enable malware to capture my system? If Secure Boot is turned on, then no, not really. The the um, in OS management, the malware can't still can't get access. Secure Boot makes sure that the firmware is ta not tampered with. That's why you have TPM. That's why you have UEFI Secure Boot. So no, uh, the fact that I don't have it doesn't make it any more vulnerable. You, as long as you have correctly set it up, you do have to worry about the update case, but that's a little bit different. What happens if the ESP partition is not available? How does the uptake or how does the update take place in such a case? Sure. Okay, I will answer this. Uh, so for example, in our case, uh, like our OS actually, uh, that is running from the storage only where we having the ESP partition, right? So let's say if that ESP partition of this storage is corrupted, then you can't do anything, right? So uh, uh, this bias update cannot happen, uh, right? So th the, the device is also not usable. And because OS is not booting, you can't update the BIOS uh, because capsule is integrated within the OS only. So let me, let me there, extend on what Manoj said there. There are some systems that are like thin client that have no actual physical storage, for example. In those cases, what in those implementations of BIOS, it's Yeah, so there is, there is one option, Tim. Uh, like mm -hmm. then you can have external USB, right? So you create EFI partition, you plug in that USB, put our secure capsule, and from there you can update it actually. Mm -hmm. 
And we have platforms also that use, for example, create a RAM disk and allow you to load it into the RAM disk and hand that RAM disk off to the operating system. Uh, right. The, so. Right. Good. Can you confirm that UEFI Secure Boot is independent from BIOS boot integrity? Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, mind. like you. You want me to get this, Manoj? Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So, this UEFI Secure Boot, uh, like you can say, BIOS boot integrity is uh, like applied before UEFI Secure Boot is actually uh, enabled, right? So, you can say these two are like independent activity. And basically, bias boot integrity is like you can say extending this UFI secure boot stuff. You need to have bias integrity in order to guarantee UEFI secure boot. If the bias doesn't have integrity, then its implementation of UEFI secure, secure boot is, is compromised by the fact that of its weakness. There are many ways to ver verify the bias integrity, but you need to make sure that there is a chain of trust that goes from Re, at least reset all the way up to the time of the OS. Otherwise, UEFI Secure Boot is, is not uh, reliable. Right, I agree. Is multi-factor authentication supported by any current BIOS vendors? Uh, sure, for point for point products, it's it's uh, something that's used on any number of platforms. It's but it's there's not like. It's not like a widespread thing, but individual vendors have decided they want multi-factor authentication, and they have implemented uh, implemented it, such things as uh, you know fingerprint readers and uh, dongles and smart cards. So, it but it's a point product thing, as far as I know. Will you be pushing capsule update customizations for to to Tiana Core for review? Uh, capsule update is already supported in Tiana Core, as I know it. Uh, so I don't there. There's already the support for this kind of secure. Um, there's already the, the support. What is the difference between secure boot and boot guard? Okay, secure boot and boot guard. Yeah. So. Again, secure boot, uh, like without any hardware root of trust, right? So Intel boot card is just like a hardware root of trust. So as I mentioned, let's say you don't uh, don't have hardware root of trust and you remove the physical physical SPI flash, right? Bias SPI flash and you mount your own, then whole chain is actually broken, all right? So in with Intel boot guard, at least if someone try to remove uh, SPI bias flash and mount their own, they can't boot it actually because here hardware will validate bias flash first and then uh, your like booting will start. Can a capsule be used to only update the default secure boot database? Um, depending on the implementation, I'm sure capsules are essentially a way of passing back data to the pre-OS environment, to the BIOS. And one of the things you could do is to update the, just the UEFI Secure Boot database. Um, that would depend on your exact implementation. Is Secure Boot multi-signing something that UEFI and Tiana Core addre will address? I can't speak to UEFI's plans. I expect my personal feelings is probably it will have to be um, coming up, but it's not currently supported as far as I know. So I don't know what the plans are. For systems with hardware ROT, is there a spec guideline as to what as what BIOS flash regions need to be authenticated? If not, does the BIOS vendor normally provide such a guideline? I can't speak for other um, for other bi uh, BIOS vendors, but certainly Inside provides guidance on, on this kind of thing for hardware root of trust. Isn't fast boot just skipping PCI enumeration phase in the BIOS? So any op ROMs uh, loaded from the necessary existing PCI devices are still verified. You know, that's a good question. The definition of uh, the definition of fast boot really is different between different vendors and different implementations. It's just a word, and different people do different things. One, you could skip PCI enumeration in some cases. In the case of uh, inside BIOS, we don't skip PCI enumeration. That's not something we do to, to increase the boot speed. Um, but uh, if you know, so that's so security is still is still an issue 
is, and we still have to check the firmware integrity of the bias itself. It's the it's the bias itself, the speed of the bias, uh, verifying the bias itself, that actually messes with boot speed, because the flash devices tend to be rather slow. They're located over slow interfaces, and so that actually takes up a big bulk of our boot time. It's just measuring it. Great. Uh, is it correct to use UEFI secure boot without common boot letters, bootloaders like Grub2? Um, you, can, you, can, you can do a direct load of the kernel, but you still have to enforce the security of it. So if you load, if you load, the, kernel, load the kernel directly, are you going to sign the, you going to sign the, the kernel? Uh, you can do it. It's just not the standard way that distributions come uh, in the way they ship. But you do have to enforce that; otherwise, secure boot's no good, right? If you don't, if you don't uh, check the hash of the, of the, whatever the kernel, the kernel, then you're not getting secure boot at all. So you need to make sure that you at least replace it with something equally as strong. Great, thank you. And that was actually the last question that we had today. Um, so with that being said, we are going to move to the live WebEx Q&A now. And this is a chance for you all to interact with the presenters and ask them questions in more of a discussion format. So I am displaying this information via an announcement and then the information is also on the screen here as well. So that being said, thank you all so much for attending this presentation as part of the UEFI 2021 Virtual Plug Fest. Um, these slides will be available on the UEFI Forum website, and we will also be posting a recording of this webinar to YouTube as well. Thank you to both of our presenters, and uh, we'll go ahead and switch over to the WebEx Q&A. Thank you, Meg. Okay, thank you.